Whitehall, 1212. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in its history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the true stories of some of its most important and baffling cases. These are the true stories. The plain, unvarnished facts, just as they happened, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names have for obvious reasons been changed. These broadcasts are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. The voice you will now hear is that of Chief Superintendent John Davidson, who is in charge of Scotland Yard's famous Black Museum. I'm sure I don't know whether a woman's stockings come in pairs, that is, shaped separately for right and left foot or shoes on. And I fear I shall never know or remember if I do. However, I do know that this one was for the right leg. And I remember further that its color was described as dream dust. Why, I'm sure I don't know. Looks a sort of a light cocky to me. Now, this pattern is not woven into the nylon or whatever it is that women's stockings are made of. Let's lay the stocking out flat here so you can see what it is. There, you recognize it? That's right. It's an impression made in greasy mud of a tire, a motor car tire. Now, the people who first saw it were quite justified in believing that the young woman who was wearing the stocking had been struck and killed by a motor car. She was struck, but the motor car didn't kill her. I asked Chief Inspector Patrick Bull here to tell you all about it. Now, Mr. Bull, if you please... About midnight on the 15th of August, 1948, leading fireman Horace Bertram Adler of Kingston Fire Brigade was driving alone on Somerset Road, Wimbledon, on his way home from a meeting of his lodge of Freemasons. It had been raining all evening, and on a particularly badly illuminated section of Somerset Road, Adler was startled to discover what appeared to be a body lying in the muddy roads ahead of him. He applied his brakes and approached it cautiously halting his car, which was a Humber saloon, about five yards away and dismounted. The body proved to be that of a well-dressed young woman. She was quite dead, and a cursory examination by the light of the headlamps indicated that she had been struck by a motor car. Police from the Wimbledon station were summoned, measurements were taken of the exact position of the body, and leading fireman Adler was released, it being obvious that his car had, had nothing to do with the accident if indeed it was an accident. The body was taken to the Wimbledon mortuary for further examination. I arrived at the mortuary about noon of the following day, the 16th. It was still raining. I wasn't happy about the assignment. I said so to David Brown, the police surgeon. Well, if you don't tell your troubles to me, Chief Inspector, I'm supposed to be off duty today, too. But yesterday was the day my relief chose to sprain an ankle playing tennis. So here I am, tennis at his age. And don't raise a row about coming in here at noon. I've been here since 8 a.m. Pity for both of us to have to be here. Well, what else are you going to do on a day like this? Might as well work. Well, here we are, working. And the other people from the yard have been here since the crack of dawn. What did they find out? Not much. So far, nobody's been able to identify her. Well, it's a hit-and-run case, of course. Obviously. These her clothes... Aye. Pretty good clothes, they seem to be. Well, she was well-dressed enough. Is her purse? It's empty. Oh. No, there's not even a lipstick in it. Hmm. I expect that's one of the reasons you're here. Eh? Well, robbery isn't usually one of the concomitants of a hit-and-run case. You think she was robbed? It's not my business to make deductions, old boy. Isn't there anything in her pockets or anything? I haven't looked. Your man says there's nothing in what pockets a woman has. And nothing to identify her either, of course. You can see for yourself. Mm. Laundry marks. Well, your man says no. Well, there must be labels. He's calling Selfridges now. There's a label in her panties there. Where? Or here. 
I doubt he'll trace it. No other labels? You said her shoes. Selfridge's too. Where are her shoes? Right there. Oh. Well, if she had an account at Selfridge's... And if you're lucky... We'll see what we shall see. Said Sherlock Holmes. Yes, quite. Well, it's my opinion you'll need him. These her stockings? I don't know, Chief Inspector. But the one she had on... Uh, muddy. It was raining last night. Looks like tire marks on this one. Well, that's what your man said. They're not from that car the fireman fellow was driving. The chap that found her. How do you know? Only he was driving a Humber, the report says. These tires would be too small for a Humber. You are a detective, aren't you? That's what your man said. Did he? I said they'd be something like an Austin 7 or a Morris Minor. One of those wee cars. I'd agree. Well, what are you looking for now? See if there are marks on her dress. In a hit-and-run case, we usually paint marks from a car, or if a lamp hit her, there might be splinters of glass that could be identified by the laboratory people. Well, there aren't. Eh? I said there aren't. You don't mind if I go over the dress carefully, do you? It's quite all right with me. But you'll not find anything. How do you know? The first place, your man admitted he couldn't find anything. I think the laboratory can. I doubt they can. Why not? Because she wasn't killed by being struck by a car. Well, now, she was found in the road. There are tire marks on her stocking. She... I suspect those marks are accidental. I doubt that. She was murdered elsewhere and brought here to Wimbledon dead. Shall I give you my Sherlock Holmes hat? Uh, come over here and have a look. Well... Now, look at her, Inspector, uh, Chief Inspector. Those marks on her face were made when her head struck the roadway. No, Chief Inspector. Or by the car when it struck her. No. Look at the right arm here. Those look like bruises made by fingers. I rather think they are. Oh. Now, lift her other arm. Ah, easy. You see? Blood, well, that's... No, there, where it's dried, on her body... What's this? There, Chief Inspector. In the second intercostal space, if you'll observe carefully, you'll note that an edged instrument has been introduced, which has severed one or both of the superior intercostal arteries. Which means, I take it, that she was stabbed to death. This message for general circulation. Information required. Any person having knowledge of the name and movements, July the 14th or 15th, the following female person is urgently requested to notify Chief Inspector Patrick Bull, CID, New Scotland Yard, W1, at once. The woman a woman's age, about 30. Reddish hair, brown eyes, Height about five foot two inches. Weight one hundred and three pounds. Last seen wearing the following clothing: black dress, white blouse. Uh, what do you call that stuff her blouse is made of? Nylon jersey, sir. White nylon jersey blouse. Red artificial flower. Rhododendron. Cerise rhododendron. Cerise. Mm -hmm. Cerise artificial rhododendron on left shoulder of blouse. Large white openwork hat. Lace gloves. Ecru. All right. Ecru lace gloves. Transparent. Platform shoes. Uh, what do you call that color? Oysters, sir. A bolting. Stockings. Ecru. Dream dust, sir. Dream dust. Dream dust, sir. Ah, right. Dream dust then, and carrying a large purplish handbag. Cyclamen, sir. Cyclamen, I mean. All right. Put down Cyclamen. I only hope people understand what we're talking about. Women will, sir. There's only one thing, sir. What's that, Miss Sears? Was she really wearing an outfit like that? With red hair? <clears throat> and, uh, green cami knickers. Beg your pardon, sir. Cami knickers haven't been worn in England since before I was born. 
Oh? And a lingerie at the stash of that. Good Lord, no. Well, write it down, write it down. I must have been mistaken. The first day, the 17th of July, that my description of the dead woman's remarkable clothing was received by all stations in the Metropolitan District for all policemen to chuckle at me, the first day it was published in the London Daily Newspapers, I had a visitor. Good afternoon, sir. I should like to speak to Chief Inspector Patrick Bull, if you please, sir. I'm Chief Inspector Bull, madam. Oh, how do you do, sir? I come about the advert. Advert? The one in the Express, sir. The one about the ladies' clothing. Oh, yes, yes, indeed, yes, yes. indeed. I seen her, sir. I saw her. Oh, you did? And you recognized those clothes? That I did, sir. Quite fashionable, aren't they? What's she done, sir? Is she on the jam lout? I always thought I'm that sure she was... I don't know whether she's a shoplifter or not, madam. And where did you learn that term? Now, look here, mister. Don't think to put your great fat hairy hands on my shoulder. I come here to give you some information you was asking for. And might I explain that you ain't got nothing on me. Nothing at all, kind sir. Well, I'm sure I beg your pardon, madam. Granted. I was asking a civil question. What she wanted for? So far as we know, madam, she's not wanted for anything, I assure you. Would you just as lief not call me, madam? My name is Miss Elderbrand, or Fence Elderbrand, if you must know. I sell newspapers on the corner of Inner Park Road and Parkside, Wimbledon, sir. That's how I happen to see this advert of yours. And thinking there might be a bit of spare cash in it. There's no reward offered, and, uh, uh, Miss Hildebrand... Well, in that case, I may as well be back to my work. I am prepared to offer... A pound, I'll take it. Thank you. Well... Now perhaps you'll tell me who this young woman with the extraordinary clothes is. I don't know who she is, I'm sure. What? Now, now, sir. I don't know what her name is. But I see her quite often near my corner, and I've seen her the day before yesterday. The 15th, just like it says in the advert. Having knowledge of the name. I don't have any idea of the name. And movements... I can describe them to you as of 10.30 on Monday, July the 15th as ever was. And I was talking to her for four or five minutes just before it started to rain. And to that I'll take my oath. Go on, please, miss. Elderbrand, all ten Elderbrand, sir. Um, what did you talk about? Lord love you, sir. I couldn't get my mouth open. She done all the talking. What did she talk about? About money, sir. Money? A man, or a man, I mean. What was his name? She didn't say, sir. But he was trying to borrow some money from her, she was saying. Said she wouldn't find her giving money to a man. Not her, she said. Not a wooden thruppence, to which I agreed. Yeah? She showed me her handbag. Oh, that gorgeous cycleman one in the adverts, sir. And... Yes? She must have had 50 pounds in it, sir, as well as about a pound and a half of hard money. I fair goggled at it. I haven't seen that much ready money since my aunt died. She had two insurance policies. Do you tell me more about this young woman, please? Well, then it started to rain, and she said, Oh, bother. But the man came up. What man? The man that wanted to borrow the money, I expect. So she says, Good night, Miss Elder Brand, and I hopped in the van, and they came away together. What's this about a van, please? Oh. Well, it was a little van. It looked like it had been, oh, I don't know, Morris Minor or an Austin Seven with a van body built onto it. And it was green. I could see it was green. And did you see the man? No, sir. I couldn't see him. You're sure it was the woman described in the advertisement? Lord love you, sir. I see her at least once a week. And I couldn't forget them clothes, could I, with that red hair? Well, thank you very much, Miss Hildebrand. You've been of great assistance. I'm... I'm sorry you don't know her name. No, sir, I don't. I hope you get her, sir. I never liked her looks. What did you say she'd done? She's dead, madam. Oh! Lord, love her death. The poor thing. Who killed her? Which was precisely what I wanted to know, I reflected morosely, as Miss Hortense Hildebrand waddled out the door of my office, mopping up tears. Well, anyway... I had our unknown victim located a short time before she met her death in the neighborhood of where she was murdered. But the green van... 
Sounded like the title of a song I remember from my youth. My Diane of the Green Van. <laughs> yes, yeah, seriously, now, there must be at least 10,000 Green Vans in London. Then the door was pushed open again, and Miss Hildebrand was back. I remembered something else, Inspector. Oh, and what this time, Miss Hildebrand? About the van, though. What about it? It had a shoe on it. A what? A great shoe. Like you wear on your feet. Painted on the side. Well? So all you have to do, sir, is find a green van with a shoe on it. Look inside and they'll be your murderer, sir. That's all. <laughs> What would you think that a shoe painted on the side of a delivery van would indicate to you? That's right. Someone who deals in footwear or repairs it or... In the telephone directories of Greater London, there are 276 pages devoted to the practitioners of the profession of St. Crispin. The number of shoe shops, bootmakers, cobblers, cordwainers, and dealers in leather findings is astronomical. And amongst all of them... There are probably three who operate a small green delivery van with a shoe painted on its side. I contemplated suicide. But I found myself seated in a bombed-out cellar that had formerly housed a famous pub, along with John Davidson, the black museum man, and David Brown, the police surgeon from Wimbledon. I drank beer. Brown imbibed ginger beer. John Davidson, not to be outdone, drank both. Shandy up, my friends, is pure nectar and ambrosia. Well, you can have it, sir. I'll take my beer bitter. And my ginger beer unadulterated by it. You boys have no imagination. My imagination staggers at the thought of interrogating every person in London remotely connected with boots and shoes. And seeing uh, what color are your bands, sir, to each of them? Well, somebody will say green. By the time we get to him, he'll probably have it painted amethyst. Have you started looking for the owner yet, Patrick? This morning, sir. No results, of course. I've heard of none. How many of these people will you have to see? About 40 billion, roughly. Seriously? Well, I reckon actually about 10,000. Perhaps 11. Wouldn't you think so, David? Uh, 12, I should think, at least. Um, how many are there in the Metropolitan Police? Not enough. I just finished reading Sir Harold Scott's report. How many? 15,647, including 67 pensioners and 122 auxiliaries. That many? Well, that was last December 31st. I should say we gained a few since then. That includes chief superintendents, superintendents... Police sergeants... Chief inspectors, inspectors... All sorts of persons who couldn't be expected to go around knocking on doors and asking questions. Signalers, laboratory technicians... Motor car and motorcycle drivers... Well, see, only half of the full 15,000 are effective to you. 8,000. Hmm. At that rate, if my guess is correct, about the number of people to be called on. Each one would have only about a call and a half to make. Oh, that's not such a tremendous job. Especially when you're sitting here drinking ginger beer. Well, don't you feel better, Patrick? It isn't quite as simple as that, sir. Not as hopeless as you thought, is it? <laughs> Well, sir, I must admit. But what if that wasn't a shoemaker's van? Set your mind at ease about that, Chief Inspector. What do you mean by that? When you telephoned me about this shoe business idea, I popped down round the corner and borrowed a shoemaker's knife from the cobbler. And? I tried it on the wound. Oh, did you? It just fits. So I rather suspect that our killer used a shoemaker's knife, too. As your cobbler or green delivery van? <laughs> <laughs> Have another shandy, Gav, sir. How's your advertisement going, Patrick? Only the one reply, sir. Miss Hortense Hildebrand. And she doesn't do so well on names, sir. No, she didn't know the girl's name nor the name on the shoemaker's green van. Too bad you can't find the girl's name. Might save us a lot of trouble and effort. How? Some of her friends might have an idea who the man is. The man with the shoemaker's knife. Oh. You know, those clothes of hers... How a woman dressed like that could escape notice wherever she went. Fantastic. I could tell you how clothes like that might escape a great deal of attention. How, sir? How, sir? 
Well, if they were worn where other women wear clothes of the same general appearance... Uh, where would that be, sir? No, no, no. Let me make myself clear. <laughs> I'm not an expert on the kind of clothes worn by... Uh, by whom, sir? Music hall performers. A music hall performer. Of course. Neither of John Davidson's ideas was as easy to work out as they first appeared. If I could be permitted, I... I think I should have to say that there's many a slip betwixt an idea and the relic of a crime hung on the wall of the Black Museum. Uh, <coughs> but John was right, as I must admit he usually is. It took many days of hard work to ask about the green van of all the names listed in the telephone directory. I would have been inclined to give up and start afresh, but Miss Hortense Hildebrand knew what she had seen and was quite vocal about it. I know what I saw, Governor. I saw the red-headed girl with a heart official rodeo dendron climbing into the little green van. And drive away, she said. And drive away. But I don't know her name, sir. On the 26th day of our quest, after 3,165 firms had told investigating policemen that they either had no green delivery van or had one of the wrong size and general description... I received a telephone call from a constable who would be making inquiries in Putney. Is that Chief Inspector Bull, sir? Yes, it's Bull here. It's Constable Beeler here. Who? Beeler, sir. Constable Beeler from the communications room. Yes. I was assigned to go out and ask questions, sir. A great many of us have that job. And yes. I found Jim out, sir. What's that? Yes, sir. He's a Mr. Colfax, sir. C-O-L-F-A-X. He's a music hall proprietor here in Putney, sir. Putney? Yes, sir. The woman's name is Sheila Colfax, sir. She's his daughter, and... You mean the dead woman? Yes, sir. Now, I asked him, sir, if he knew who killed her, sir. Uh, how would he know who killed her? Well, I don't know, sir, but I thought I'd ask him. What did he say? He said he didn't know, sir. Well, bring him in here. Yes, sir. He doesn't want to come, sir. Why? Why? Him and she's a strange sister. They don't like each other. Ah. Uh, look here, Constable. Ask the gentleman where he was on the night she was murdered, the 15th of last month. Don't alarm him. I know where he was. What? How do you know? He was in hospital, sir, with his legs broken. He's still in bed here at his home. He was hit by a tram, sir. Thank you, Constable. Beeler, sir. PC 317, A Division. I'm afraid we don't live right, I thought. That door which had opened such a little way closed with a dull thud. And Constable Beeler and all the others went on with their questionings about the green van with the shoe painted on its side. The 22nd day passed. The 23rd. 24th. At 4 p.m. on the 25th day, a Mr. Fox was announced. He came in and sat down. Sidney Fox, Chief Inspector of the Fox Shoe Repairers, Tottenham Court Road. I'm your man. I think you'd better explain, Mr. Fox. I have a green delivery van. Oh? It's a Morris Minor chassis. It has a large shoe painted on each side panel. So? I could show it to you. Well, I'd like to see it. Where is it? In the firm's garage on Charlotte Street, just off Tottenham Court Road. We don't use it anymore. I should think you wouldn't. Oh, oh it isn't that. It isn't what you think. Oh? No, sir. We haven't used it since Lionel left us. And who's Lionel? Lionel was our delivery man. And where is Lionel? Well, he told Harry he thought he'd go to Spain. Who's Harry? My partner, my brother. I wish you'd be more frank with me, Mr. Fox. Why is this Lionel going to Spain? Did he leave your employ of his own accord, or did you discharge him? Well, I'll tell you, Inspector. Lionel stole, <laughs> let us say, embezzled, a sum of money from us, a considerable sum. I see it. I finally set a certain date for him to return the money he had taken or be turned over to the police. What was that date? The 15th of July. I see. He did not return it. Well, he didn't even come back to the shop. 
But Harry told me Lionel had assured him he'd have the money that night. He knew where he could get it. He didn't say where? No. How had your brother seen him if you hadn't, Mr. Fox? We always allowed Lionel to keep the van at night. He and Harry both live in Houston, and he always drove Harry home at night and back to the shop mornings. Where did he keep... He kept the van in his own garage. Is Lionel married? He had been. Well, the next day... Sixteenth. Yes. Harry drove in alone from Houston. I said, where's Lionel? Where was he? Did a bunk, Harry said. Oh? Harry said about six in the morning, Lionel came to his house and waked him. Said he was sorry. He got some money, but it wasn't enough. Told Harry he was leaving. Going to Spain, he said. Couldn't stand the disgrace and all that. Said the car, the van was in his garage. Here are the keys. Bang over it. He's off. And what did Harry do? Well, he went over to Lionel's garage. There was the van all freshly washed and... Washed? And Harry drove it in. We've kept it in our own garage ever since. If Harry wants a ride home, he can buy one. And where was this Lionel going to get the money to repay you, Mr. Fox? The money he didn't get, so he washed the car so carefully and went away to Spain. Well, from his wife, I suppose. His former wife. He saw her quite often. Oh? Daughter of a rich... Uh, Theatre around me in Putney. What was her name? Colfax, I think. Come along, Mr. Fox. Let's go and have a look at your green van. And so we found the green van. It had been carefully washed. Not carefully enough, though. There were bloodstains in the cab, and David Brown proved they were the same blood type as that of the murdered woman. And hidden under the seat cushion was the late Sheila Colfax's smooth leather wallet with 70 pounds in it. Not enough to give to Sidney and Harry Fox. There was a bloody fingerprint on the leather. It wasn't hers. And out in Lionel's garage, where the car had been, the good constable Beeler found a knife. A shoemaker's knife. Just like the one David Brown had tried on Sheila Colfax's body. The blood on it was her blood type, too. Oh, yes, and we found Lionel. He was hiding in the garage with a great tin of biscuits, a round of cheese, and a jug he refilled daily from the tap, he told us. The first thing we did was check his fingerprints with the one on the leather wallet. They matched, of course. So we arrested him. And when he'd shaved off his guilty accumulation of beard, he was brought to trial. It took the jury 15 minutes to bring in a verdict of guilty. And he was hanged at once of us before the first frost. And a curious thing. Upon a thorough examination being made of the body of Sheila Colfax, it was discovered that she had been in the last stages of cancer at the time of her death. She would have died of that dread disease in less than four months. Perhaps she did have reason for wearing those fantastic clothes. Heard on Whitehall 1212 today, Horace Braham as Inspector Bull. Others in the order of their appearance were Harvey Hayes, Pat O'Malley, Beulah Garrick, Lester Fletcher, and Guy Spall. This is Lionel Rico speaking. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. Every 20 seconds through the year, a fire breaks out in the United States. These fires fill 11,000 persons each year, disfigure for life or severely burn thousands more, and destroy $7 million worth of property. Protect your homes from fire by following these simple rules. Don't smoke in bed or throw away lighted cigarettes. Clean out closets, basements, and attics. Any place where old newspapers, magazines, and inflammable materials are liable to accumulate. Remember, don't gamble with fire... The odds are against you. Follow the campaign of the next president on NBC. 